we're here today with Lindy Rama Ellis, um, also known as Lindy Klim, and she's one of our guests today to have a conversation with us. And I think Lindy is really uh, exceptional to have in these chats because she has lived in Bali for a very long time. And you're also half Balinese, if I'm not wrong. I am. I'm half Balinese. Yeah, so I'm actually really, really curious and interested to hear about uh, your, um, you growing up. Where did you grow up? How did you end up in Bali? And mm -hmm. because I really sure. thinking about that. I know. It's very, it's very confusing for a lot of people because I'm so Australian at the same time. So my mum is uh, Australian and my dad was Balinese. Um, they got married in Bali in the 70s and then they had me about uh, like two years later. And then the normal kind of, you know, sort of, sort of combined marriage of different cultures kind of sort of happened and they kind of just didn't see eye to eye on very many things. And mainly it was a cultural sort of difference that they both had. Um, so they decided to get divorced. So then I ended up in Australia with my mum and I didn't see my dad for many years. So I didn't see him until I was 11. And then I saw him again when I was maybe 18. So I, I hardly knew him at all. And so I went from Bali to Tasmania. So not even Australia, I mean, Tasmania is in Australia, but very small island. I was pretty much the only Asian person. I used to always say, <laughs> on the island. You, so it was part. kind of difficult for me growing up in that sense of just having, you know, my life. Sorry, from, Sorry? Where, from 11 to what age you were in Bali? So I was only, I was only three. So I was three years old when my parents divorced, I went back to Australia. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's very interesting that I had this kind of, different kind of lifestyle and, and you know I looked very different as well growing up in Tasmania and I didn't see my dad at all and it wasn't until I um, got pregnant with Stella who is now 14 and she you know I decided that maybe I should sort of contact my dad and get to know him a little bit more but then unfortunately he actually passed away at the same time I had her in hospital. So, you know, it was a week or two weeks in between. So Stella, Michael and I made it back to Bali for his cremation. Um, but there's many, many, many different kind of ceremonies that go on with the death, but we made it for the last one, thankfully. And then ever since then, I've kind of felt this massive pull to come back to Bali and just to get to know my family and to get to know the culture. And I always felt like a little bit of a, you know, a fake Balinese person, mainly because I don't speak the language fluently, um, and two, because I don't really understand the culture so much. So I thought it was really, you know, I really should come back here and get to know it a little bit more, and especially for my children to get to, you know, for them to grow up with it as well. So that's why we're here. That's pretty amazing because it's quite a... Um, yeah. yeah. The culture, you know, people move to Bali for different reasons. Um, Yours is quite a uh, personal reason, I would say. You know, it's a connection yes. to your family, yeah. to your, mm -hmm. you know, part of your culture that you have kind of lost touch with and yeah. because of, you know, family circumstances. Yeah. You've come back to really yeah. get in touch and understand it, I guess, and mm -hmm. give children. And yeah. Totally. But then there's also that other side that happens when you're here and you've got your big family and then you kind of get, you know, involved in your own life and your own sort of expat living. Um, and then I actually, now I'm a terrible, you know, niece. I hardly see my aunties and uncles as much as I'd like to. Um, I still see, you know, I'll go to an occasional ceremony and, and, you know, social media is great because I can always keep in touch with my family. But, yeah, it's not like I thought. Like, I thought I was going to move to Bali and be full Balinese and wear my kabaya and my sarong and do ceremonies every day and do the full. <laughs> but it's not quite like that. But it's still nice. I still feel like I've got the best of both worlds being here. That's cool. Yeah, I guess it's not yet, obviously. I think it would be very hard to... And, you know, unless you were marrying a Balinese person to really get into that whole exactly. experience, it's not actually that easy, I feel, to penetrate. Um, I don't know, 
experience. Yeah, and that's why my mom and my dad divorced because she's, you know, and this is the 70s when there weren't really a lot of sort of interracial marriages at that time. So, you know, my mom found it very, very difficult being married to a, a Balinese person. And, and I think for her it was more, you know, if you're like the women are very protected. So when she had me, she couldn't even walk down the road on her own. She couldn't, I had to have nannies. So she couldn't do things that she wanted to do with me. She always had to have people around her. And I think that was their biggest struggle. And then when my dad went back to Australia with my mum, his biggest struggle was having to have a job. <laughs> so it's very like, you know, he had a nanny until he was 24 or something <laughs> stupid. So he was very shocked at this notion of having to sort of work for money. <laughs> so they sort of didn't see eye to eye on those sort of things. And also I think it's the, that what you said about having your mum being protected by all these people constantly surrounded it surrounding in her and protecting her is much pretty very much what Balinese life is about it's all about the village looking after you right. having that sense yes. of, um, community of people always being at a, an arm's length to say hey can I can I have a hand with this or can you do this for me exactly that would be such a shock to go to Australia and not have that support system That's yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I feel I can see how it happens and it happens to so many different marriages and this is kind of worldwide. I mean, even I can notice like my husband now, Adam, he's English and there are even cultural things there and, just, and England's you know, not that different to Australia, but still I'm like, oh my God, it's because you're English. It's like really annoying me. <laughs> you know? So we have that cultural difference, even that, but then going to a third world Asian country and you can imagine the difference there especially in the 70s so you know so anyway that's where I am and that's how we're in Bali and we've been here for eight years and um you know I've got four children yeah so I had Frankie Frankie was six months when she moved here and now I've got Goldie who she was like six weeks when we moved here so and they're the blondest out of or, you know, before, like the two oldest are very kind of Balinese looking and the two youngest who speak Indonesian are the blondest and the fairest out of them. So you it's kind of... Balinese, fun. little blondie ones. Yes. <laughs> okay. Exactly. How do they feel living here? Is this their home or do they feel having that both the Australian and the Balinese background, what do they consider to be home? So Bali is home, definitely, 100% home. Um, so Rocco, though, my son, he's very much, like, he likes structure. He is very, he likes rules, he likes structure, he is very into sport, he likes clean. Um, so he always talks about Australia and he likes going to Australia and he likes going to Singapore as well because they have that sort of structured, clean kind of way of living. Um, but then he's also quite Balinese in his ways. So I think he's a bit both. Like he quite, he can, he can be in both sort of places. I mean, all the children can be. I mean, we travel a lot. Um, but I'd say Stella, the oldest, who's 14, her life is very much Bali. So, you know, that Stella and Rocco go to the green school and that's very social. So Stella's whole life revolves around the green school and friends and Bali and knowing all the locals and surfing and that's who she is and then for the two younger ones they've only known Bali so they've not known Australia or anywhere else at all so they're happy to visit those places but definitely Bali is very much their home and what they know so it's kind of it's kind of interesting and they're both well Frankie has a very American accent um, Goldie, the two-year-old, is starting to have an American accent, but the other two, the oldest ones, still have an Australian accent. So it's interesting how that. Funny accent from Bali, like so many kids that I. My kids is funny because my kids. Well, I'm from Argentina, and my husband is Australian. Right. Uh, but yeah. my, I think they have Australian accents, quite Australian accents. But I do hear other mm. kids that have kind of also mixed up and the kids have American accents and I'm like, where is this American yeah, accent yeah. coming from? <laughs> They're not even American. Yeah. It's really, 
<laughs> it is very strange. I used to think it was from Frankie's teacher and she did have American teachers, but then she also had a fair share of British teachers as well. So I think it's a combination of them speaking because both Frankie and Goldie speak Bahasa. So I think it's a combination of them speaking Bahasa and rolling their R's and then even I know like with certain words I will sound more American for Balinese to understand me kind of thing. So I think that's where it comes from. But yeah, it's very kind of high-pitched American accent that really grates on your ears sometimes. <laughs> but it's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> and can you tell me, um, in this in these conversations, I talk about um, entrepreneurship, and I think you are quite an entrepreneur um, in your life. You first, you yeah. your model. Obviously, everyone knows this. <laughs> I think you're yeah. more model because I think you can be a model but you're something else how would you describe what you are do you know I've been asking myself this question for many years it depends and we're just doing that immigration or customs form it just depends on what day that they have me on sometimes I'm a teacher well now during, during quarantine I'm definitely writing teacher um but yeah model some, you know, I've been an ambassador for brands for many years. So I was an ambassador for like Amiga and Le Mer and Ferrari and Louis Vuitton and those kind of brands. But then I used to own a skincare company with my ex-husband, Michael. So I, I guess, you know, I had 10 years or more, 12 years in skincare with him. Um, and I'm just about to launch my new product, which is coming out in August, which is skincare again, but it's all down there. So it's a feminine sort of hygiene product. Um, which is exciting. So that's called Fig Femme and that's coming out in August. Okay. But yeah, I'd say I'm an entrepreneur. Like I, I didn't go to university. Um, I'm terrible at, I'm dyslexic. I can't spell. I'm terrible at math, but I'm quite creative in my thought. And so teamed with the right people and I think knowing uh, what I'm good at and what I'm not good at is very, very good thing to do because I you know you can't be good at everything and I identify that really really quickly and then I find people around me who are good at the things I'm not good at um, and then I have my team and then that's how I can get things off the ground because I can't do this I can't do that and da, 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 da. but I do know I have great ideas and team with the right people I can often make those ideas work which is which is good do you think um Bali is a hub to making your ideas a reality? Yeah, I mean, I think Bali attracts a certain type of person and they are mostly creative people who, you know, they're not vanilla. They don't want the normal, you know, picket, white picket fence house. They, they are looking for adventure. They want to do things differently. Um, and, and Bali is a really good base for that, especially in, in, you know, nowadays with the internet, you can do anything from Bali and to be surrounded by sort of like-minded people is really, really important. You know, quite often, you know, I go back to Australia and I see everybody, you know, they're saying, you know, they're kind of boring jobs and they're this and that and, and it's, you know, and I do kind of get jealous about the kind of structure that they have. At the same time, I love the freedom that I have to be in Bali and to think the way I do and to be creative and, and to be surrounded by sort of the like-minded people that don't judge me for my crazy, weird sort of ideas and they kind of encourage me and let those sort of run wild. So definitely I think Bali is, is a great place for, you know, entrepreneurs and people to sort of just get out of their comfort zone, really, um, and to you know, enjoy. The island has so much to offer. And as I said before, with people around you, it really helps you kind of be who you want to be. Yes, I agree with you. Um, yeah, it has come up with that uh, in the past with other conversations about the amount of people, creative people that live here is also encouraging. And, and it's not, for example, and I've said this, Oh, I, haven't, I would have never started what I've started here anywhere mm -hmm. else. It just yeah, exactly. It was just not yeah, it. no question. So yeah, yeah. that's great. 
a realm of possibilities yeah. and in other places people would just look at you and say what are you doing why are you think <laughs> 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 exactly <laughs> the idea like no don't go ahead you know and i think and especially in australia this is the big fatal poppy syndrome where people oh. push you down and yeah exactly. and, and you have a creative yeah. and you have all these crazy ideas people usually tend to say that's too hard or you can't do it or you need too much money like they, they will find a way to somehow you know diminish yeah, a hundred percent. And I, you know, as you said, it is that tall poppy syndrome, and they don't really kind of get, you know, just get your thinking. You know, it's just kind of too crazy for them, and that's fine. Like I absolutely understand that. And as I said before, sometimes when I am in Australia, I kind of am jealous of their kind of quite simple, not simple. That's a wrong word to use, but structured life. And it's very, you know, they've all got the bank account set up and their superannuation and this and that and da, 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 or everything is mapped out. I live a little bit more on the edge, which is, you know, kind of good and bad. Bad during COVID because, you know, my savings are running out. <laughs> and had I been like my friends in Australia, I would have more savings and superannuation and things in the bank to live off. So, you know, things like COVID really shape that up for creative people like us when, you know, you're not really thinking about future you're thinking more in the now um luckily you know my husband is quite sort of he thinks more on that level so we do have a few savings that we can kind of live off in these times but you know they're going to run out soon so i don't know what we're going to do but um yeah covid does test those kind of you know limits i guess uh, but now that you just mentioned the living in the now i think isn't though that which something that everyone wishes to be doing living now yeah i mean i think it's really important to you know i've always i mean i i live in the now and that's and i guess that's what's happening all over the world like you, it's made everybody slow down and really kind of just be and that in a way even though there's so much sort of chaos going around or you know everywhere in the world i guess it's really forced people to totally take a step back and just focus on now which is quite important i think yeah i agree do you think there will be on a global basis do you think there will be a change after COVID, or it will just things will just come back to to the way that things were no i think there'll be a change i think people will definitely you know view life sort of completely differently um i think that it's a fantastic thing that we have have been forced to slow down and even just for the world in itself like it kind of needed that moment to breathe you know like it was just chaos and even i don't know if you're in bali in december like christmas time bali was just crazy like the traffic and the people and the energy it was a bad energy like i kept saying to my husband something is going to happen because it just bali cannot handle cannot cope it just can't and I know that for, for Bali right now is really struggling and, you know, the local people are just have, you know, a, you know, with no work and no jobs and no home, like they've got nothing right now. And it's a horrible, terrible thing. Um, but at the same time, Bali did need to have that moment just to breathe a little bit. The unfortunate thing about that is that I think that it's going to take a very long time for Bali to get back to where it was. The rest of the world, maybe not so much. I think, um, you know, in Western sort of places, it's kind of kind of going to go back to normal. But for some reason, especially places like Australia, they like to sort of give Bali a bad rep um, in the media and things. So Bali will take a little bit longer um, to sort of come back to where it was. But yeah, I do think it's sort of I don't know, it's a bittersweet because I think really for the world it did need to take a breath, but at the same time so many people are struggling and, and, and really doing it hard. So, yeah, it's a tough one. I agree with you. I feel like, and sometimes I feel like, have this, it's not a theory, obviously it's real. Like what I'm saying is, of course, happening. Of course. But um, I always feel like Bali is very much alive. It's yeah. alive in its 
everything. And when I feel like when it starts to get a bit fed up with tourism, oh, like my yes. phone starts speeding up, you know, it's almost like that's it out. everyone get out of my phone. That's it. That's it. And it just leaves it. <laughs> 100%. Like, honestly, that traffic situation in December, I was just like, just like, there's no infrastructure here to support that kind of, you know, and even, oh, I don't know, just had a bad, a bad feeling about it. And the people that were coming here and abusing the island at that time, it was just didn't, it didn't sit well with me. Um, I like, you know, the people that have stayed there, like the true Bali supporters, you know, that they really love Bali and want to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope it does. I really want Bali to get back to where it was and I want the locals to have their jobs back and things to sort of pick up, but I don't want it to get back to how it was. Um, I know a lot of people hate me for saying that, especially my friends with restaurants and, and bars and things, but it just it wasn't the Bali that I moved to for eight years ago. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, th I think you're right. I think something needs to shift the, the infrastructure oh, yeah. to support the amount of tourists that come. And, and now you realize this when there's no tourists, how easy it is to yeah. go anywhere you want. And you're there like, exactly. Hey, Gina, you're like I know. Hey, Usually it takes me an hour or like 10 minutes. <laughs> it's crazy. I know. We went to Uluwatu um, two weekends ago for my son's birthday, and it was literally 20 minutes to get there. Like, it was nothing. Like, it was amazing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was definitely Bali eight years ago. It was a, it was a nice feeling. But, yeah. Have you, have your kids have ever thought about going and studying in Australia? Has that ever crossed their mind? Yeah, I mean, we actually had this conversation with Stella today, actually, because she was kind of like, oh, that's right. She said to me, yeah, you know, I might go to university and then, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to have a gap here. I'm like, well, dude, like, how are you going to have a gap? Like, where are you going to make some money to have a gap year? Like, most people have, like, a, 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 like a job, like a weekend job, and then they save their money to go on the gap year. But teenagers can't have a job in Bali because they don't have either to work. So, you know, they can't actually even, they can't, you know, I mean, I had to work at KFC when I was 14 to get my, my money. But these children can't actually do that. So it's interesting. Like she will definitely, and fortunately enough, my ex-husband and I have a, good, you know, a lot of contacts in Australia where she can definitely go and, you know, you know, just be like an apprentice or just work out, you know, for that weekend or that week and get the experience. But for a part-time job for teenagers, that's just not a thing that happens in Bali. So I don't know. Stella is very much entrenched in the Balinese way of living and or not so much Balinese way. That's a, a lie. More her life. Uh, <laughs> my friends. Yeah. Her, her friends, her community, um, the green school, that is her. Rocco will definitely end up boarding. He's into sport, um, so he'll end up in a, a boarding school probably or living with his, his grandparents or his cousins in Australia. Yep. And the other two children, I don't know. But that's always a, a, a subject or a topic on, you know, that we're talking about and trying to work out what the best sort of move forward is. And obviously I don't want my family to break up or to for us to separate in any way but you have to do what's right for your children and unfortunately that might mean that Rocco is away but then at the same time you know before COVID I was traveling to Australia you know once a week or sort of every second week so I'd be able to see him anyway but um it's a it's a tough one and especially with children sort of in that teenage years you know do you want them on motorbikes do you want them to be able to go to clubs, do you want all, the, you know, it's kind of hard and we've sort of had a taste of that with Stella recently. Um, lucky for her now, or lucky for us now, nothing's open so she can't sneak out and go to the clubs and things like that. But um, it's definitely a, a thing that worries me. About. Yeah, I can imagine. And yeah, even, well, my kids are um, small, like your little two. And yeah, it's something that definitely we consider. Although my oldest one is super responsible, she's like an adult, she's more adult than me, so she's probably not gonna like sneak out of anything. You know? That's awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, she's the wrong person. Uh, but yeah, she's definitely always think about. She very much, even though she she's been here for nearly four years and only lived in Australia for three years, she mm. very much thinks of herself as Australian, and she wants yeah. to go to Australia and start. Now she wants yeah. to London or something. I, I don't know where she gets yeah. these ideas, but she's very much. She doesn't. She's a plan. Yeah, she has a plan, and she I can see where it's heading, even though she's seven. But you know, she really. Mm. Um, has a vision uh, and my little yeah. one is very much he doesn't he doesn't let someone ask him where are you from or something and he said where am i from <laughs> he just had like no idea no concept of like where he's you know, born that's so cute i like that though that's really cool <laughs> that's very sweet it was very cute i'm like well you're from australia but he feels more like balinese he feels you know he's yeah. and he speaks balinese even um, yeah, he's six months old. So for him, wow. his song, like his favorite yeah. food, chicken and rice and bakso. So you know. Yes, exactly. Long yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the thing. I just guess you know you've just got to you know adapt to you know, and that's the thing. Children change their minds. You know, like Stella's always changing her mind. You just kind of have to adapt and just roll with it, and not have really any set or plan you just have to you know that's the kind of not really unfortunate but mo a challenging thing I guess about living overseas or somewhere different compared to your hometown is that you have to kind of work out these sort of little situations that are going to arise but you know eventually it works itself out and you kind of you know I might have children kind of all over the world and that's kind of cool as well you know I can go and visit them and, and hang out and it's kind of exciting. I'm just amazed that you have four children. Like, I can't even imagine <laughs> how you're close right now with four kids. <laughs> and the one I'm, oh. I'm like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, I'm gonna kill one of the other. Honestly, like, it's really, I, I would not have had four children if I knew I had to homeschool, let me tell you. Like, I, as I said before, I'm not. I'm not studious, like I can't spell, I can't, I'm not, I'm not good on technology and then two of them having, you know, they're full on computers and then uh, Frankie's at Montessori and so, and their home learning is amazing, like they've really got it down pat, but it means I have to log her on like every hour and be right there and then I have my own company that I'm launching and then I want to do, you know, I want to be able to exercise or go to the toilet or something and you can't because you're just there. And then I've got Goldie, who's two, just running around and driving everyone crazy. So it really is, has been difficult. I mean, my only saving grace is that my ex-husband, Michael, has the children every second week. So he has three of them, like he'll have them, he has them tomorrow for a week. So it gives us a chance to breathe, regroup, and then we have them a week again. So, um, yeah. It's hard. I have just hired today a tutor for Rocco because it got to the situation where he was so unhappy. As I said before, he's very structured. He wants to have things mapped out. He wants to know what he's doing and it wasn't happening with homeschool. So I got him a tutor today and it was amazing. So she's coming back tomorrow <laughs> and then she's going to keep continuing until school finishes. It's just, it was too much. Yeah, it is too much. And it's very hard, I think. Like, I'm, I'm the same as you. I'm terrible at maths. My kid, my seven-year-old is actually better than maths, than me right now, already. And I'm yeah. like seven. And she's so <laughs> And I'm like, I'm counting. I'm like, one plus two, you know. And, you know, I, I, it's a full-time job to do this homeschooling. I, it's yeah. really hard. And if you have three of them homeschooling, I would just be yeah. I literally will <laughs> I was angry about I know. <laughs> it's like that. I mean, fortunately, like, you know, living in Bali, there's so many holidays. I mean, today was a holiday. I mean, nobody really knows why, but it was a whole Last week, I think it was a holiday. And then the green school, they have a day. Wednesday is no screen day. It's like, like, how do you have an on-screen day when you're, it's online learning? <laughs> like, it's just stupid. So you kind of have some breaks, but at the same time, I really had to kind of just say to them, you know, if it's not working, the day off. Just have the day off. Let's just do something else. And we have sort of like with Rocco, I've been teaching him how to cook. 
Um, we go on bike rides. We do something else that's kind of educational in my eyes, um, but not so much sort of studious-wise. Yes, I think that's great. And it's true. You have to mix it up a little bit. Um, yeah. you know, because it's, it is exhausting for them yeah. and also for us. Like, And as you said, you're about to launch a business. It's like how yeah. do you, like you're trying to put your mind onto something and then you have to like think about math and then you know, English and then like geography and you're like, I can't do it. Yeah. It's too hard. No. And, and especially with so many different like um, kind of device, like devices and apps and things like there's, you know, Google Classroom and then there's WhatsApp and then there's Zoom and then there's like something else and it's like oh my god what are we logged in on and like we're trying to work it all out and I was like, it's, just, it's yeah it's crazy so i think we're kind of a little bit unfortunate in bali as in you know australia and going back to school i think this week and we won't go back to school until august at montessori and i'm not sure about the green school but we definitely i mean i think i guess we've got school holidays coming up in june anyway but at yeah. the same time it's like i just back in school <laughs> i'm still paying for the school fees and that's all they should be in school <laughs> oh I, I agree with you and we're uh, well luna's school is actually going back in two weeks but we have decided not to check not to put her in school to say yeah. way to lock us, uh, because we're yeah. the over cautious side of people uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's Phoenix, actually. My little one, he's also his school just started, but we also decided just to wait till August. We're just going to just wait a bit. We feel like it's a bit full on suddenly from complete isolation to just like, there you go, back, <laughs> back into the madness. I know. Like, they'll be like, what? My God. Although they're dying to go back to school. They're like, please, I want to go back to school. That We just feel like, yeah, we we'll wait till August and reassess. But we are yeah. personally wish we could just like, go take them away from us so i can't wait i mean it's so difficult for them because you know there's quite this and they're very barley like they're so social these kids you know they're probably more social than they are anywhere in the world i'd say because they've just got the opportunity to be so really missing out on everything and especially sport like my kids are sporty like they i'm not even not sporty sporty but they they're outside they're surfing or bike riding or you know, even just tennis, like everything. And it's like not being able to do that is really, really challenging. Um, yeah, it's it's a hard one because I'm not, you know, I'm quite sort of active as well. So for me to sit in the house and sort of do just homeschooling all day, it's just not my jam. It's not what I want to do. It's really difficult. Yeah, same. Could you, um, can you tell me a little bit about this business that you just mentioned before that you're about to launch? Yeah. So I'm, I'm quite intrigued and a little bit <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so, um, so as I said, I had Milk & Co with my ex-husband and, um, and so, you know, he, he, still is, he still works in that and, and, um, and has that business. But I, that was kind of what I knew was skincare, and I really like to try and do things that are new. So when we had Milk & Co, I developed a baby range, of, like one of the first organic baby ranges for, for babies, which was not that sort of heard of. So I like to try and do new things, things that are going to sort of get people's attention. And then after having four children, I, you know, and I had them all naturally as well. And I know what happens down there, and I was really surprised that there's not a lot of products out there there to help you with the recovery or to help you in general like even for a date night to get ready like you put a face mask on your face but you won't put a you know a face mask on your vulva and that's what I'm bringing out is a face mask for your vulva wow. so I'm doing one for post birth so the one for post birth is pretty much like an it's kind of an ice pack you can put it in the freezer and then you put it on after you've had because you know you get given in hospital not the best looking kind of ice packs to put on um, after you've had a baby. I got no, no ice pack and I'm like, what about it? Everyone talks about, like, hey, nobody can me any ice packs. <laughs> what happened? Exactly. And it hurts. You're swollen, uncomfortable and it's, you know, and my, my, my masks are very, you know, they're beautifully packaged. It's called Fig Femme, um, you know, and it's a beautiful gift to give to somebody in hospital. So I've got that and I've also got a caesarean strip for people that have had a caesar. Um, that helps with the healing of the scar. 
And then I have like a date night mask called um, Restore. So that's sort of like to get you ready for your date. You know, you're getting, you've got having your glass of wine, putting your face mask on here, putting your vulva mask on. <laughs> helps get rid of your ingrown hairs. So I'm really going down that road. So I'm bringing out like a, a wash and a spray. Um, yeah, so it's exciting because there's not a lot in that space. Like there's definitely some kind of older brands like Femme Fresh and things like that, which I 100% know most of my friends use, but are too embarrassed to say so. So I want to have that conversation. I want people to be able to talk about, you know, their women bits. I don't want it to be like a taboo subject. And having three girls... Um, it's important for me. It's important that they are able to talk about what's going on there. And I guess having this brand is open for that discussion. And, you know, my website would be very, um, you know, very sort of conversational as well. So I have tips and sort of things on there and people can write in for some advice. And it's just really opening up that whole kind of, you know, that whole world of <laughs> I think it's great and I think it's a uh, well obviously it's a very creative idea because I haven't seen a project like that before um yeah but so it, it, as you said it opens the conversation of mm -hmm. what's going on down there yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. Something you just really don't talk about even with your friends or with anyone else really with your doctor exactly I know. I mean, I, I do because I've had so many kids and every, nothing is like off topic for me. I'm like, nah, you know, and I'll always try and pick out another person at the dinner table who I can talk about those <laughs> topics with as well. <laughs> and, I often, yes. and I can often relate to people as in if somebody's a little bit difficult to talk to, I will find out if they've had a child and then I can really open up that conversation by talking about their birthing experience or whatever. Like it's just really, that's something that women can really connect on and relate to. And I think it's important. And a lot of women don't talk about it. And it's just, you know, we've all got one. And, you know, and I guess it's all that sort of doctors years ago would say, well, you don't, you know, you don't use anything down there. It's, you know, it cleans itself. And, and I'm not saying to wash your vagina. I'm not saying to put soap up there or anything. It's actually on the outside and there's nothing. It's just the skin on the outside. So it's not messing up your pH levels. It's completely safe and completely fine. And it's like just having that me time and, you know, connecting with yourself. And I think that sort of self-care kind of comes into it. So that's launching in August, which is really, really exciting. How long have you been uh, working on this project for? Oh, so long. So um, probably two years. It's taken a really long time because one is I had to get the, the mask cut to shape <laughs> and to get it's like a cookie cutter. So I had to get that made and then to find some of the factories that would do it. Um, and then also I think finance has been a big one for me too because it's really expensive launching a company like this. And trying to save and, and work out what to do or to set it up correctly. And I've made mistakes in the past with businesses where I wasn't really well protected um, and, and I wasn't kind of clued on to the actual business side of things because I'm more creative. I let that slide and then I end up in trouble. So with this particular business, I really made sure I had the right lawyers and the right accountants and everybody sort of working on it to protect me and to make sure that nothing bad was going to happen. So um, I spent a lot of my time and effort in that and that alone I think took about eight months to do just to set the company up. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so finally. And then COVID happened. So yeah. I was supposed to have the product like, you know, uh, March, no, February end of Feb and then it didn't happen because it was made there's a component made in China so COVID happened and so now I won't get it to August but um you know everyone's at home there's nothing sort of else to do so you might as well try a uh, mask on your on your vulva instead <laughs> bit of self-care <laughs> I love it and I love that you just created this product that it's just didn't well I have never heard of it that didn't exist so you can just gonna go for it I think people are, and I think you are, I think you're right. I think it will be successful. I think people are ready for it. And, yeah. and I think sometimes it's about timing, isn't it? Like yes. It's yes. about just being at the right time at the right place with the right idea. What makes right. business yeah. apart from all the other stuff. 
what's yeah, exactly. accessible. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, had I released this um, before the whole Me Too situation, it probably wasn't right because there wasn't enough talk about it. People weren't really kind of really talking about that kind of stuff at all. And then Me Too happened and then women are like, yeah, you know, actually, you know, this happened to me or that happened to me. Or, yeah, why can't I talk about my, you know, vulva or my vagina or whatever? And so now I'm at that place where I was like, actually, you know what, it's perfect timing. Like in... You know, even though COVID happened, maybe it happened for that reason, just, just to, you know, just to let everything settle for a bit and then, you know, for people to be really truly ready for it. Um, and, you know, it wasn't ideal. I didn't think that launching a product like this, uh, talking about Involver so openly during COVID where people are losing their jobs and lives and everything was going to be great. But now that things are settling down a little bit more, I'm like, well, you know what? What else are people doing at home? You know, you may as well be doing some self-care and uh, trying a new product and maybe the time is right. So, yeah. fingers crossed. Do you, I mean, obviously you've told me that you've learned big lessons about, um, you know, getting the right lawyers and accountants to launch. Oh. So we've had a quite a few, a, a few businesses, maybe how many? Two or three businesses before. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what sort of advice would you give to someone that has an amazing idea just like yours and things like oh. this? Uh, what, what would be your best advice? Is, is, no, I know you're not a business kind of mind, but yeah. you have businesses, so you yeah. know about business. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing. It's probably to, just to know your shit, you know? Like, you've got to know what is going on within your own company. And it's quite often with me, I'm, even today, like, I'm like, no, that's not my area, you do with that. But now I make sure I'm CC'd on everything. I will read through everything, even though I don't understand it, even though I don't actually quite get it, but at least I've read it. So then I can't say, oh, I didn't know about that, or, oh, that's not my fault, because I don't, I don't want it to be like that. Like, I need to know things. And if I didn't understand it, that's my fault. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just think that you have to be across everything and really make sure that you do have the good, you know, good people around you supporting you and get those people in to know, to do the things that you can't do. Like, you honestly, like, I don't know anyone that is good at everything. They might think they're good at everything, but they're often not. Yeah. So you've got to own up to that and really make sure that you have someone or people around you that can do the things that you can't do. And that, that's important. No ego. No ego. Yeah, I agree. I think um, um, when I've, I've had two businesses, this is my second business that I've done. And um, like you, I have and some good, some, some things I'm really good. I'm really good with ideas. I'm always constantly having ideas of what to do. And, but I'm terrible at accounting. You know, I'm terrible at stuff. But I had to do it yeah. myself for a long, quite a long time. Uh, right. Only recently uh, I got an accountant and my husband helps me with, you know, just keeping up accounts yeah. and keeping up invoices because I'm like, oh, did that person, I can't remember, you know, and then, you know, uh, just keeping track of things. Uh, but yeah, nobody can do everything. But at, you know, sometimes when you begin to, you don't have a choice. You can't, do, right. you know, if you're, partner sucks at the same things that you suck then it's not why yes. to, to them yeah yeah <laughs> exactly all yourself and until you have the funds to be able to handle exactly. you don't know to yeah. someone else that's right and i think you know in lean on friends like quite often you will know the people within your group of friends who can do those jobs or who can give you advice you know for sure like it took me a long time to, to ask for help. Like, I don't like, I always used to think it was using people. I don't want to use that person. I don't want to, you know, ask that person. But they're your friends. Like, you know, you hang out with them all the time. You can always say, hey, you know, I've got a problem with this or do you think you can just look over this email for me or whatever. So lean on them a little bit more because more often than not, you've got so many people in your group of friends that can help you with most things, you know, to do with whatever company you've got going on. Yeah, I, I agree. And yeah, it's very, sometimes I think it's, uh, I, I'm, now I'm getting a lot better. I think as I get older, I get better. But for a long time, I was scared to ask for help. And I think it's uh, maybe, uh, 
maybe I don't know why I was scared. I, maybe I felt like it was a weakness or I didn't want to bother them. Yeah. Like, no, they're so busy. I don't want to, you know, like they already have too many things on the plate. Yeah. You know, I don't want to put something extra. But you do it. You have to ask yourself because nobody knows everything. Everyone That's right. Out. Exactly. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to leave you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and telling us about your new endeavor, which is really exciting. I'm really excited for you. Thank you. It's super nice to talk to you. Finally, I always see you on Instagram, but I've never got to meet you in person. So this is close enough. <laughs>